deeper in God's vineyard gather together today to give thanks and praise. On this 25th Sunday of Ordinary Time, the Mass intention is for Kitty Ritchie Rhodes. Today you are welcomed by members of our Befriender Ministry. We thank them for their ministry and for serving as host ministers today. Today is the first day of Children's Liturgy of the Word for this school year. All children ages three through first grade are invited to come forward when Father calls them up. There's no registration parents, so if you have kids ages three through first grade, you can just send them up. And youth, middle and high school youth, um, if you would like to help volunteer to, um, to sit with the kids, that would be great. When Father calls the kids forward, you can just come back to the narthex and they will meet you there. If you have any questions, you can find me after Mass. Today we will be challenged by another parable. In today's parable of the workers in the vineyard, the landowner may challenge our sense of fairness and our sense of an honest day's work for an honest day's pay. However, Isaiah reminds us in the first reading that God's ways are far beyond the ways of human beings. Today, Jesus teaches us about God's radical generosity. I am the salvation of the people, says the Lord. Should they cry to me in any distress, I will hear them, and I will be their Lord forever.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare ourselves to celebrate this sacred mystery, let us call to mind our sins. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. God, who founded all the commands of your sacred law upon love of you and of our neighbor, grant that by keeping your precepts we may merit to attain eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. This time we invite children ages three through first grade uh, to come forward for Children's Liturgy of the Word. No registration is required. Uh, they'll go and learn about the Gospel reading at a level appropriate for them. So we invite children for that to come forward. Children, may God bless you as you go forth to listen to the word of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call him while he is near. Let the scoundrel forsake his way, and the wicked his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord for mercy, to our God who is generous in forgiving. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways 
your ways, says the Lord. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are my ways above your ways, and my thoughts above your thoughts. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Brothers and sisters, Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, life is Christ and death is gain. If I go on living in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. And I do not know which I will choose. I am caught between the two. I long to depart this life and be with Christ, for that is far better. Yet I remain in the flesh is more necessary for your benefit. Only conduct yourselves in a way worthy of the gospel of Christ. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
From the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord. Jesus told his disciples this parable The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, the landowner saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You too go into my vineyard, and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, the landowner found others standing idle, standing around and said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you too go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, summon the laborers and give them their pay beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last ones worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who bore the day's burden and the heat. He said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Jesus has done it again. He's come up with another incisive parable that just gets under our skin. Jesus does this on purpose to force us to take a hard look inside ourselves and reconsider our attitudes. Most of us, as we listen to the parable, naturally empathize with the workers who were in the vineyard all day long. They were there all day working hard in the heat of the late morning and the afternoon, and yet at the end of the day, the workers who worked just one hour in the cool of the evening receive the same pay as them. That can strike us as unfair, that people are not getting what they deserve. I want us to focus in on that sense of unfairness today, and I want to give a little teaching on a point of Catholic doctrine which can shed some light on the message of this parable. I want to talk a little about the Catholic teaching on justification and merit. Now I know that might sound a little abstract and theological, but bear with me here. Now we hear these terms all the time. We had one of them in our opening collect today. Grant that by keeping your precepts, we may merit to attain eternal life. Merit, deserve, reward. We hear these terms a lot in the prayers of the Mass. So there's definitely a place in Catholic theology and life for what we deserve with God, for being rewarded for what we do. And this is good. It gives a dignity to us. Think again about the parable about those men standing around in the marketplace all day with no work, no way to provide for their families. Now the vineyard owner is clearly a generous man and he wants to help them. So he could have just gone to the marketplace and given out a denarius, the day's wage, to all the unemployed men there and just sent them home. But he wanted them to participate in the gift that he was going to give them. He wanted them to have the dignity of a worker and he knew they wanted it too, and that it was good for them. So we have this element in Catholic moral theology that we are rewarded for the good we do. But there are limitations to merit, big limitations. First of all, 
we can never merit or earn our justification. Our justification, that is, our being made just or righteous, our forgiveness from sin and restoration to God. By the original sin we inherit from Adam and by our own personal sins, we became enemies of God, unable to please God by anything we did, unable to earn or deserve anything except damnation. No action of ours, no good works, could bring us out of that state. Only the free gift of God could. St. Paul says this in Ephesians, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. Our salvation, our changing from an enemy of God to an adopted child of God, that's all God's work. Jesus Christ did that on the cross once and for all. We receive that salvation in our baptism, and if we reject that salvation by mortal sin, we're restored to it in the sacrament of confession. After that point, once we are made just, that's when we're able to do works that merit a reward. But they're all on the foundation of that radically undeserved gift of forgiveness. So that is the first limitation on the notion of merit. Second limitation on merit is that once we are justified, the good works that we do, you know, avoiding sin, growing in virtue, the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, praying for others, all of that is done not on our own strength, but by the power of God's grace working in us. Grace gives us the strength we need to keep the commandments and do works pleasing to God. It's his love in us that gives us the very ability to love others and so be a witness to God's love to them. So the good things that we do are as much the work of grace in us as they are our own works, or even more so. It's kind of like a light switch on a wall. You know, you flip the switch and the whole room is lit up. Now, did the switch do that? Well, yes. But it's also, and even more so, the work of the electricity flowing through the switch into the light bulb, which lights up the room. If you cut off, if you cut off the power, the switch does nothing. Just so with us, the good things that we do really are our works, but they're done by the power of God. And if we're cut off from that grace, we can do nothing deserving of reward. The third limitation on merit is that it can't be used as a way of comparing ourselves with others, as a way of competing or proving how much better we are. In the kingdom of heaven, it's not a competition. And in heaven itself, those who loved and served God less on earth are not disappointed and envious of, of the great saints. In heaven, every person is as happy as they can be. People who've loved God much while on earth have stretched their hearts, and so they are able to contain more love, more joy. But each of the blessed, from the greatest to the least, is totally fulfilled. So merit can never be uh, used as a fuel for any sort of competitive spirit. So all of that means that a great sinner, you know, one who's totally selfish in life, who hurts people and maybe even kills other people, who cares only for earthly pleasures, but if he has a conversion while on his deathbed and is baptized or makes a good confession, a sinner like that would receive fundamentally the same reward as a great saint, one who loves the Lord all his life and serves him zealously, you know, someone like Mother Teresa or maybe a great missionary like St. Francis Xavier suffering hardships, torture, and martyrdom for the love of Christ they would both receive salvation, and both would be totally happy in heaven. We can feel a sense of unfairness with that, perhaps, just as we do with Jesus' parable today. How can those who came to the vineyard as the day was ending receive the same wage as those who worked all day long? Well, our sense of unfairness with this misses the point. The point of the parable isn't the workers earning a wage, but the vineyard owner being generous beyond what is deserved. In fact, in one of the commentaries I looked at for this passage, 
It was, the passage wasn't called the workers in the vineyard, the way we often refer to it. It was called the good employer, a generous employer. That's sort of the focus of the parable. And how much more so with us, our spiritual lives are not about what is fair. The Christian life isn't about getting what we deserve. In Christ, we get far more than we deserve. What we merit does have a place, but it's a small place. And the emphasis is always on the gratuitousness, the freeness of God's gift to us in Christ Jesus. Our justification is a free gift of God, which we did not deserve. Can we then turn around and complain how unfair it is that God has given some others a gift that they don't deserve? Can we justly or even coherently complain because God has done the same thing for others that he did for us in giving us a gift that we don't deserve? So the first point of this parable for us is not to complain at God's gifts to others. As the vineyard owner says, we should not be envious because he is generous to others, resenting the good things that they receive and wishing in our hearts that they were still impoverished or lost. Those kinds of feelings can hide in our hearts sometimes. Let's ask the Lord today to cleanse our hearts of any traces of that envy and resentment. The second point for us today is if you find yourself feeling unworthy, that you've sinned and even though you've been forgiven, you still feel like because of what you've done, there's no way that God can love you, that you don't deserve to be saved. And many people feel this and they're right. You're right to feel that you don't deserve it, but neither does anyone else. That hasn't stopped God's love though. We don't have to deserve that love. We just have to accept it. And finally, after receiving God's unmerited gifts, our only response can be one of gratitude and praise. Just imagine what those workers who came at five o'clock felt after receiving the full denarius for their brief labor. Now, maybe at first they thought it was some kind of joke or trick. Once they realized it wasn't a joke, can you imagine their joy and gratitude? Well, brothers and sisters, we are all in the position of those last hired workers. Whether we worked for God for a long time or not much at all, we have all been given the gift of salvation which we did not deserve. Let's be grateful to God. Let's praise him with a glad heart. Let's sing joyfully to God. At the Eucharist today, let's offer up the gratitude and joy and praise in our hearts together with Jesus' perfect act of worship and thanksgiving to the Father. Let us worship the Lord, for in Christ Jesus, he has given us far more than we could ever deserve. Together, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things are made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, who is crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit. 
Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Trusting in the infinite generosity of our Heavenly Father, we bring him these, our petitions. For all who proclaim the gospel with their lives, especially priests, religious, teachers, and missionaries, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who labor in the vineyards of peace, especially national leaders and elected representatives, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who work towards fair labor practices, especially lawmakers and union leaders, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all who hear the gospel message and respond without envy, rejoicing in God's generosity to all, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all suffering from earthquakes and hurricanes, especially those who have lost their lives or lost loved ones, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those with terminal illnesses and those who are approaching death, and for those who care for them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who have died, especially Dan Skluzacek, Scott Hunt, Cecilia Bell, Shirley St. Martin, Harold Lamberty, and Leonard Schmiesek. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Father, hear us. In your great love, answer us. For we make our prayer in the holy and powerful name of your Son, our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen.
pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our and the Holy Church. Receive with favor, O Lord, we pray, the offerings of your people, that what they profess with devotion and faith may be theirs through these heavenly mysteries, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For through his Paschal mystery, he accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession, to proclaim everywhere your mighty works. For you have called us out of darkness into your own wonderful light. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. have created rightly gives you praise for through your son our Lord Jesus Christ by the power and working of the Holy Spirit you give life to all things and make them holy and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the Sun to its setting a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name therefore O Lord we humbly implore you by the same spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, o Lord, until you come again. Therefore, O Lord. As we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, 
and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Faustina and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Bernard, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the glory, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. <laughs>
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. Graciously raise up, O Lord, those you renew with this sacrament, that we may come to possess your redemption, both in mystery and in the manner of our life, through Christ our Lord. A couple of announcements. The next Men of Mercy gathering, sponsored by the Knights of Columbus and Divine Mercy, will be this Monday night at 6.30 p.m. in the KC Hall. We look forward to seeing all of you there. Next weekend, we'll be joining other parishes in the Archdiocese in taking up a second collection for Hurricane Irma emergency relief. Any support you can offer will be greatly appreciated by us 
and of the people of the Gulf Coast. We will have an animal blessing in honor of the Feast of St. Francis on Sunday, October 1st. The blessing will take place at 3 p.m. here in the church parking lot. Cats, dogs, sheep, calves, chickens, birds, seeing eye dogs, any kind of animals you can bring will be welcome to receive a blessing. Family faith formation is in need of one to two catechists and four to five assistants. The time commitment is two to three Wednesday evenings a month. Please contact Terry Hunt at the parish office if you can help out with this important task of passing on the faith to our children. We would like to remind everyone that there are two openings on staff, one for a steward of facilities, head of maintenance, and one for a faith formation administrative assistant. If you're interested, please see our website or call the office for more information. Finally, both the uh, St. Vincent de Paul Society and the Baby and Mommy Project will have their collection containers in the narthex next weekend. See the bulletin for more information. Have a wonderful Sunday and a blessed week. The Lord be with you. And May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.